welcome back. And today we're back on the one bit vacuum tube computer. In the previous episodes, we started figuring out what kind of memory we were going to use. And well, ultimately we're going to use vacuum tube memory. And we built up this little test piece here. This is a one bit module that has all of the uh, addressing logic also on it. And I, man, I really like the way this is turning out because we're using a 6977 VFD or vacuum fluorescent display. Now a VFD is really only intended to be an indicator of sorts, but it's built like a vacuum tube. It has a anode, it has a grid, it has a cathode, which means that we can control how the electrons are flowing through it. And well, that meant that we were able to use it as half of a flip flop. So our visual indicator is also a switching element that is storing the bit. I, I just, I really love how that turned out. Uh, but well, what we're gonna do today actually doesn't have anything to do with memory, except for the fact that I'm using a 6977 VFD on it. And that's because on the processor, I'm not using a 6977 VFD. I have a ton of indicator VFDs on there, but they're all IV15 VFDs, which are kind of a Russian reimagining of the 6977. So what I wanna do is I wanna replace all of the IV15 VFDs on the processor with 6977s. This sounds like a colossal amount of work for what will ultimately be a lateral move, uh, but I have some specific reasons why I wanna do this. So let's pull the processor out, set it on the bench, take a look at what's bothering me and what we're gonna to have to do to fix it, uh, and then, well, I'm gonna have to cut a lot of new circuit boards and do a ton of soldering. So let's pull the processor out and get started. All right, we've got the processor on the table here. I've got the lights off in the room to hopefully make it a little easier to see the uh, VFDs as well as the VFDs on my remote control here. Uh, we'll go ahead and flip the power on. The soft start should do its thing. And yeah, I can see it kind of bounced up to a little over 10 amps and that's coming down as the tubes are starting to warm up. There we go, the soft start kicked off. We jumped up to over 15 amps and now it's coming down to settle in. And our uh, little remote control here is displaying stuff, which is good. I, <laughs> I had it set to uh, all on, I guess. Um, but, well, we look like we're displaying the right stuff. Let's see if we can get a uh, 0000, a NOP0 instruction into the instruction uh, register. Uh, so we'll hit the clock and yeah, well, we can see that the NOP0 light came on on here and well, the entire instruction register is off. That's, that's good news. Let's initialize it uh, and we'll do that with an IEN instruction, which is 1010, we'll put our data to one. Uh, and that's this VFD up here. And yep, I can see that that VFD came on. We'll do 1011, which is OEN, which is this VFD down here. And yep, I can see that VFD came on. And then next, let's get the result register and the carry register to a known state. Right now, the carry register looks like it's storing a one and the result register is storing a zero. So we'll do an operation of zero, one, zero, zero. This forces a one into the result register and a zero into the carry register. And yep, I can see that happens successfully. And then we'll do a load instruction of zero into the result register. And yep, that worked as well. So uh, fantastically, it seems to still be working. It's been a couple of weeks since I turned this on and I was a little nervous that something might be broken, but it all seems to be working really well. With the exception of the VFDs, they're a lot dimmer than I would have hoped. For example, these five VFDs on the end, this one is the closest to the camera and should be the most visible. And it is the NOPF VFD. So if we do an instruction of one, 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 that is a NOP F. I'll hit the clock and I can see that the VFD has illuminated, but I am almost positive that you guys can't see that. I'll bring the camera in closer so you can see it, but it is very dim. Uh, and so this is kind of what I'm hoping to remedy with uh, changing over to the 6977. And the issue is not with the VFD itself, but with how I've wired it up. 
So let's slide the processor out of the way and I'll show you the massive mistakes I made when uh, designing how these VFDs are working on the board here. All right, here's the data sheet for the IV15 VFD. Now being in Russian, uh, well, we can look at some of the specs down here and kind of get an idea of what we're expecting. Uh, the filament here is going to be 0 0.8 volts. Uh, and then the filament current is going to be 42 milliamps plus or minus five milliamps. Uh, and then I believe that the maximum voltage that you can put on the anode is 50 volts. And if we take a look at the data sheet for the 6977, we can see that the filament is one volt at 30 milliamps. So I just need to tweak my dropper resistor kind of ever so slightly. Uh, and then if we look at the maximum ratings over here, the plate voltage has a maximum voltage of 65 volts. So with both of these VFDs being so incredibly similar to each other, why on earth am I changing from the IV15 to the 6977? And well, there's uh, two reasons behind this. The first is that I found uh, this board on eBay, which has a boatload of uh, 6977s on them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I ended up buying two of them, actually. <laughs> Uh, and it's kind of a shame to uh, cannibalize the boards for the 6977s, but they're going to be going to a good cause. And since I have so many of these at my disposal, I really wanted to keep some kind of VFD cohesion going on between the processor and the memory itself. But with their characteristics being so similar and the voltages that I'm working at, uh, the brightness shouldn't be any different between the 6977 and the IV15. And the number one thing that I complained about demonstrating the processor was the lack of brightness. So let's take a look at how I wired up the IV15 first. And you can see in this uh, extremely simple schematic, I only really used two resistors. I have a big uh, 820 ohm dropper resistor coming off of 24 volts. This is for the filament. And then I tied the grid and the plate together and then have that going through a 22,000 ohm resistor to whatever input signal is coming in. I did this because I wanted it to be as compact as possible. However, there is a major problem with this, and that is that the input signal is, is not always 24 volts. Uh, sometimes it's as low as 18 or 19 volts. And while that works fine for the processor, I have a massive amount of overhead on my logic lows and logic highs. Uh, it's not giving me enough voltage for a, a very bright VFD. So if we take a look at the schematic that I'm going to use for the 6977, we can see that the input signal is coming in through a massive resistor, a one mega ohm resistor, and then there's another one mega ohm resistor that goes to minus 12, and the input into the grid is pulled off of the center point of these two resistors. What this means is that when the input signal is low, the grid is pulled negative and the VFD is cleanly off. When the input signal is high, the grid is pulled positive, which allows electrons to flow between the cathode and the anode but also our anode is held at 24 volts regardless through this little 4.7 thousand ohm resistor. But what this means is that it will always be the same brightness, no matter whether our input signal is at 18 volts or 24 volts. Uh, so we should have a much more consistently bright VFD using this style. And actually I think I can demonstrate this pretty easily on the breadboard. All right, on the breadboard here, we have a 6AU6 pentode. This is just set up as a standard inverting amplifier. That means that we have a uh, 33,000 ohm resistor on the plate. We pull our uh, output directly off of the plate. The cathode is connected directly to ground. And my input is coming in through this little uh, 100,000 ohm potentiometer. Now the output coming off of the plate goes over here to this little switch, which allows me to switch it between the 6977 and the IV15 that we have here. And right now I have it switched over to the IV15. So if I turn this potentiometer up, we should see the IV15 come on. Yeah, there we go. And if we flip the switch here, we can take a look at the 6977, and yeah, it's actually really bright too. Uh, as a matter of fact, the brightness looks uh, pretty much equivalent between the two of them. However, the problem is not when the potentiometer here is fully cranked up, because when it is, the tube is fully in cutoff, and we have a nice strong 24 volts coming off of our plate here. And we also aren't showing any other draw on that plate. If we have uh, multiple things hooked up to the output 
output of one inverting amplifier, it's going to pull that value lower and lower. And that is where the problem is. Because if the value coming off of the plate is not a strong 24 volt, we get a much dimmer output. Uh, you can see I'm simulating that here by restricting some of the electron flow uh, with the grid value. But uh, man, you can see that, yes, it's still illuminated, but it is very, very dim. This is what I think we're seeing. We're not getting a strong output, and that's not allowing the IV15 to glow at its best potential. So now let's flip the switch and take a look at the 6977. Well, we can see that it's still very bright, and then it's off, just like that. There's maybe a little bit there in the middle, but not much. We're either full brightness or fully off. And that's because now we're using the output from the 6AU6 to only enact on the grid of the 6977. And it doesn't take a whole lot of change to go from cutoff to saturation. So it's not a failing of the IV15. As a matter of fact, if I wired up the IV15 like I have the 6977 wired up now, it would be totally fine. But since I have to remake the boards anyways to accommodate this new way of wiring it up, I might as well swap over to 6977s and keep the visual indicator look consistent across the entire build. And so all that's left now is to get to work building the replacement PCBs. And this gave me a good opportunity to test out how wide of a PCB I can cut on the mill reliably. I took two of the longest PCBs that I have to recut for this, put them end to end, and well, as you can see, the, the mill is doing it with no problems whatsoever. And this is fantastic news because the memory boards that I need to cut are going to have four bits of memory on one PCB, and those are gonna be very long at about 480 millimeters. And well, this technique looks like it's working beautifully here, so it should work beautifully for my memory boards as well. With all of the boards cut, the next step was to solder them up, and that was, <laughs> It was a pretty arduous journey. Uh, it took me more than one day. And actually the number one question that I get about my vacuum tube PCBs is what am I using for a socket? And I'm using these Harwin H3161 one millimeter PCB pin headers. Although they're not as good as a proper socket, they work just fine for these low temperature 6AU6s that I'm using here. And once I had all of the PCBs soldered up, it was time to get them in place on the actual processor. And this took a bit more effort than I was expecting because some of the PCBs are in the center of the processor, which required me to take quite a lot of other stuff off and get it out of the way in order to swap out the PCB. But once everything was together, I was almost ready to power it up but I wanted to address the soft start first. The previous version of the soft start, I used two relays in parallel, and that's something that you're not supposed to do. And a lot of people left really great comments about that. And so I wanted to fix that. And I've got two proper 30 amp relays that should do the trick perfectly without any of the worry that we had from running relays in parallel. All right, we're all back together, we're powered up, but the processor itself is not yet initialized. So let's uh, go ahead and do that, and make sure that everything's still working. So we'll start with an operation of 1010, turn our data to one. We'll clock that in. Yep, I can see that our input enable register is on. Then we'll do 1011, clock that one in. Yep, we can see our output enable register is on. That's fantastic news. Uh, and I can see that our carry register is storing a one and our result register is storing a zero. Every time I power it on, it seems to pretty much always fall into that state. Uh, so we'll do a zero one zero zero operation to put carry to zero and result register to one. And then we will load in a zero. Now we're all initialized, ready to execute any programs. Everything seems to be working uh, perfectly, which is fantastic news. The VFDs are marginally brighter, but they're consistently brighter. Even with the lights on, I personally can see them. So let's go ahead and go to an operation of 1111. That's gonna be uh, a no operation F flag, which should be this VFD that's closest to the camera here. 
And yep, there we go. We can see that it kicked on perfectly and uh, hopefully the camera's picking that up a little better. Now before I shut this thing off for the day, there is one more thing that I want to test out. Let me get that set up right quick. All right, I have my one bit of memory test piece that we built in a previous episode. And well, you can see there's some jumper wires coming off of it. And that's because it's actually hooked up to the rest of the processor. However, it's only hooked up for being able to store. Uh, whatever's stored in here can't be output because, well, that requires some extra stuff and I don't have that hooked up. But what this means is that we should be able to take whatever data is on the data bus in the processor and store it into our single bit of memory. Now the memory is a little deceiving because the VFD is illuminated when the memory is storing a zero and it is off when it is storing a one. So it's kind of backwards of our conventional thinking, which means that since it's off, this one bit of memory is currently storing a one. Uh, and right now our result register is storing a one. So we will do an operation of one zero zero one, which is store complement. Uh, and so what that means is that the complement of the result register, which is currently one, is going to be a zero. We're going to put a zero onto the data bus. And then when I hit the clock, that's going to cause the green wire here, which is our right line, to tell this bit of memory to store what's on the data bus. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, check that out. We stored a zero in our one bit of memory over here. So it's, it currently has that zero stored and I can load something else into the result register, which uh, is storing a one right now. So let's go ahead and load a zero into it. And now if I do another STOC operation, that'll store the complement of the result register, which is zero. So it'll put a one on the data bus and that should store a one into here, which should turn the VFD off. Yeah, <laughs> that's super cool. All right, it took a couple of days of pretty hard work. We got all of the IV15 VFDs replaced with 6977 VFDs. Even though it feels kind of like a lateral move, I'm really happy with how this turned out. We also got our new soft start installed with proper relays on it. No more of that uh, two relays in parallel malarkey we were doing before. And it seems to be working perfectly. As a matter of fact, the entire processor is still working perfectly and we were able to get it to store something on one bit of memory, which is super epic. I'm really happy that the right signal made it over there just fine and it was able to store that because now all we have to do from here is just expand that out. Go from one bit to four bits. That's the next step. And then from four bits to eight bits and then eight bits to 16 bits and all the way up until we fully fill up the amount of memory that we're going to build. Now, there's probably still some questions floating around about uh, how much memory we're going to have and how we're going to go about addressing it or accessing it. And we're going to get into that in the next episode. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you then.